Now on today's video, we're going to answer some questions that come in on our comments section on our channel. Most of these questions are relating to motorcycles or painting or both or other things relating to technology relating to that area safety, for instance. But the basic thing that connects all of us together here is the friendships we have through motorcycling and exchanging information, exchanging some funny stories, maybe exchanging some of our track day experiences, our street ride experiences, our restorations, paint work. It all connects because we all share a passion for motorcycling. And in my case, the passion goes further than that into painting and, and into trying to help other people enjoy the sport of motorcycling or in, enjoy some of the restoration jobs that we're all doing together. And we call these videos Question and Answer Ask Wendy. Now, this is number five in our Question and Answer series. Thank you to everybody that's shared information, sent me information that I didn't know. And I'm going to share, try to share the information that maybe will save you some time, save you some money, make you a better rider, make you a safer rider, and maybe you'll live to be 76 like I did. Now we post up video every day and the first four of these this series of question and answer are already out on our channel and we try to post something interesting every day relating to motorcycles, relating to painting, or maybe just some good tips that can save you money or and in a lot of cases save you a lot of aggravation. And if you have a question to ask, leave it in the comments section. I'll try to answer it on a future video. And it won't matter whether you like older motorcycles, newer motorcycles, faster motorcycles, touring bikes. We love them all. So let's get started. Okay, so today the first question is from Paulo. Paulo apparently works for a dealership. And I don't know if he does or doesn't. He's in Florida. He sent me a question. He, was ha he wanted to find somebody to tune his RD400, basically the same bike I have, and what I thought, one of, the, one of the objectives I always have in sharing information, and that's what this channel is all about, one of the things that I do enjoy is linking up two people that can help each other. Well, I know Ray lives in Florida, he's still got my, my original 350 race bike, and I, I sent him a copy of that email. Now, it just turns out Ray's on the other coast of Florida. I don't know where some of these towns relative to Florida are, but, but anyway, Ray, you know, at least responded, and what I think would be, would be great, a great idea, I thought about this, and I also sent Paulo an email about this, is if all else fails, look for some dealership near you that does a lot of dirt bike stuff, because they would have a mechanic probably that still knows how to work on two strokes or is familiar with it. That's, that's the only suggestion I have, other than if you're going to work on a bike yourself, you can usually get a manual off eBay even because you're not going to find any new ones. And usually the, the, the two things that you have to deal with, the jetting and the carburetors, that's all explained on YouTube videos. And the one thing that is critical with those bikes is the timing. That timing, and Luciano and I did ours, the one I ride, with the dial indicator and get it right on the money. And that is critical, especially with the gas we have to use now in today's, whatever you want to call this, the world we live in today, we're putting water in the fuel from now on. Anyway, that is one of the things I think we possibly can do with our channel and with YouTube is share that information. And I used to send people to Vince when Vince worked. Maybe Vince is, uh, doesn't work on bikes anymore. I haven't seen him in a while. But anyway, when we found somebody in need to find somebody that could help, that's part of the information we can share. So some information that really is important when you have older bikes, like the two-strokes, is if there's a somebody even close that does still work on these older bikes, and usually they'll, they're looking for work too, and you're looking for somebody, and sometimes we can make that, uh, you know, I can be the Yenta and make the, the marriage made in heaven. Sometimes it doesn't work out. It's too far away. Okay, the next question, and this is a good one. This is the kind of information I like to share. It's from a, a fellow named Rob Roy. He wanted to know how much I lowered the R1 forks. And the good thing about doing a thing like this is you can search around for what other people have experienced. Now, in my case, uh, there's an amount you can realistically lower them, and I think that's about 10 millimeters. But you can always look on the lower fork leg or the upper fork leg where the machining stops on an MT-09, it's pretty obvious, 
what the adjustment is. And you can, the, the good news is with this, it's like anything evil twin stuff. If it, if it doesn't work out the way you're happy, or if that quick turn in doesn't work for you, or it may be that your personal riding style. Now, some people, if you're doing track days, guys are experimenting with those kind of things all the time. They even have the, the more modern bikes, the MotoGP bike, you lower the back, raise the front. It's a constant tuning thing to suit the rider. And not all riders are the same, but it's an easy thing to do. I showed it on video a few times. It's the kind of thing that if it works for you, great. It's like a seat on a bike or handlebars. What works for you might not work for me, but I started with 10 millimeters anyway. And I probably could go to 15, but it works so good at 10, I, I haven't had to touch it. Anyway, and the thing is you can always put it back. Now I've lowered many of the bikes for me and it works well because number one where I'm riding is a lot of very sharp, twisty second and third uh, gear turns. And when the roads are slippery, I like that little quick turn in feature. But again, not everybody will. <laughs> this is a question from just the, the initials of ST. And he, he commented that if he had watched some videos about reinforcing the delicate parts of fairings on sport bikes, boy, is that ever a good investment. And if you ever even see the slightest little crack where there's a tab and there's a bolt and you see a little crack in the paint, Take it off and put some carbon fiber or even fiberglass, e-glass in the back. Before that crack goes, and you lose that piece. See, putting that piece, once that piece is broken, now you got to line it up. It gets more difficult. And again, on my channel, if you put my name in quotation marks, fairing repair, done that hundreds of times. And it's not, it's not a hard thing to do, but once that part breaks off, or, and it's really important to know how to do that if you're going to do track days or you dump the bike, crash it, drop it. Or it's just an old bike, like I buy the bikes, and the, the parts are missing. They're in a box, and sometimes you don't even get the parts. Mark Morgan brings me a bike with a fairing with a hole in it. You could reach in and adjust the carburetors. I had to make that piece. And uh, just to follow up, on our channel, and this is a promoter that I fixed for Vlad, and uh, just to show these are the things, and these promoter fairings are very thin. You can see the cracks in them. This is one of the repairs that's on our channel. You put my name in quotation marks and fairing repair. This, this video in total will come up. These are just some outtake pictures. And the whole idea of doing this is to repair these parts before they break totally through. Now, it's not that difficult to do. As long as it hasn't cracked all the way through, it's, it's kind of easy to do. Once that part breaks and you have two parts in your hand, all bets are off. So, all that information is on the channel on previous videos. These are the kind of comments I enjoy, and Karen does too. A guy named David, and thank you for these nice comments. All the people send nice comments. I do enjoy and I do read them all. He said he loves the matching screens and the scoops in the front and the piece in the back. And I have heard that from so many people. I'm wondering, maybe I stumbled onto something. I don't know. But I always let Karen look at something, and I always look at the pictures on my computer. I do my photo shoots, I look at the pictures, and then I decide, mm -mm. and thank you, John Pothia, for making it possible to do all this Photoshop work that we've done, including the logo that's on our custom t-shirts now that are available from T Public. And I have the hot link if you want to order one of these shirts from T Public. They are available and the hot link is in the comments section uh, of the video of course and it's two mouse clicks away to have one anyway if somebody does want one and they have sold a few of them already so uh, when somebody says they like something that i did i always feel good i'm inspired to try to share more information because the reality is if you know something that i don't know and you give it to me you still have it and it didn't cost you a penny and I have learned so much over the years from YouTube videos, I, I can't even make a list. There's too many. Everything from fixing my ice maker, my stove, motorcycle repairs, it's great. So anyway, this is a question from Kevin. And Kevin and I have gone back and forth a few times. He, he has an MT3, a 7 and a 10, but he does not have a 9. Well, that's what second mortgages on your house are for. you got to have them all. Trust me, I know. 
<laughs> Ask Karen how she, how she knows. <laughs> anyway, his question was, and I wanted to answer this. This is something I'm sure most people know. I didn't know until I bought the MT-09. The MT-09, he says, I don't know, it's a wheelie monster. You might be right. I don't know. I've seen an awful lot of guys with MT-09s go down the road with the front wheel up in the air and do stunts with them and stuff. I, it's not for me at 76 to do that. Now, but I can tell you something that's really neat about the MT-09. If you're not into wheelies, but you do like to do, you know, hold the throttle wide open from time to time, well, here's the thing. Turn the traction control off, and you'll be doing wheelies for the rest of your life. I leave mine on the most invasive setting because the roads I ride on are covered with salt and stones and uh, who knows what. It's usually wet in the morning if I go out early and, and whatnot. But anyway, they, and I, I need to share a little funny story. The, doing wheelies used to be fun when I was a younger kid, and we would all have RD350s. You'd be in a parking lot at, at some store and uh, at McDonald's and trying to outdo each other. But, but unfortunately, I got old. I aged out of that. But, but I do have, and it's a great memory for me, I do have, I was on the cover of actually three magazines, only two I have copies of, where, and I was doing a wheelie. And, and the guy that took the picture on the cover, I had my Suzuki, and he kept saying, go back and do another one. Go, I didn't get you on that one. Go back and do another. And so for a whole afternoon, we're on this, I don't know what road it even was, doing wheelies, doing with. At the end of the day, I said, oh, my God, I'm... And I'm in my full leathers and everything. And luckily, I still have copies of that magazine around to remind me. <laughs> and that is true, 1976. And there's a copy of the magazine. Now, I loaned the magazine to Carl and Michelle, the real one. But there's actually two magazines. And I think it's pretty funny. It's a good memory for me. But you know, not many 76-year-olds are into the stunt thing. I'm into the uh, just ride and enjoy the day thing. And there's a picture of the bike, and that, that was a very unique bike for its time, for 1976. That had all Norton fiberglass bodywork on it, and of course the Suzuki two-stroke triple water buffalo engine. That was, that was a real piece of work in 1976. And just for reference, that's what the bike started out looking the first time I painted it. It had several paint jobs before I turned it into a cafe racer. Here's some good information to share from Jared. Jared wanted the paint code for certain bike, whatever the bike is. It doesn't matter what bike it is. You can get paint matched at a, any body shop that has a camera. The camera match, usually pretty good. I used it on the MT-09. Worked for me. You can also, if you have, if you don't have the paint code, and obviously most of us don't, maybe all of us don't. The, the other choice is, and I've had really good luck with, and Joe Padula has too, and so has Luciano, I believe, getting paint from Colorite. Colorite, the paint is a few bucks more. But it's re usually a really good match. Now, Joe's, the, when we did the Ducati fairing repair, right on the money. Right on the money. Now, the, a lo any local body shop that sells body shop supplies is going to have that camera matching ability. And when you buy camera match paint, it's usually a few bucks more. In this day and age, I never like to quote prices because everything's a lot more. I, Karen bought some pork chops the other day. I thought she went out and bought a, you know, another bike for me when I saw the receipt. But anyway, that's, that's a true story. Now, another thing, this is funny. Another, another, I love these comments because they, and I always try to answer them with, with, a, with a response that makes sense. Because a lot of times, what happens is the question you ask is not really the right question. So here it is, this is a guy named BJ, BJ Lees, I believe it is. And if I'm saying somebody's name wrong, please excuse me. He looked at the Baja No Pinch uh, and, and uh, didn't know if it would work on sport bikes. Well, I did mount a few tires with that, and it is possible to mount them, but I don't think that it's any better or worse than the other methods we all use. And when I do tire mounting or dismounting videos, I try to do each one different to show the different methods that have worked for me. The spoons, obviously. I don't have a tire mounting machine. Uh, I That the, the uh, Motion Pro thing that... The, Breaks the bead, that works. The Harbor Freight thing works. It, pretty much everything works. If you can get the, if you don't have painted rims, now I, because I don't want to scratch my rims. If you have flat black rims, well, take the spoons and put the thing on there to Motion Pro and just pop it off. But if you're real fussy, you know, I know a lot of my friends do not want to see a scratch on their rims, especially if you have Marchesini wheels or something. So anyway, that I would say 
it does work, but I'm not sure it's the best way, and, and it's certainly not the only way. So again, if you go to put my name in quotation marks and mounting tires, there is every way possible you can mount and dismount that I know of, except for a tire machine. If you have a tire machine, I guess you're limited, but, and I really hate, I really hate to scratch a rim. Okay, this is why I love doing these question and answer things. A fellow named Brett, and Brett, thank you for this information, mentioned that you can down, I don't have the manual for the MT-09 yet because nothing's broken. It's kind of like by buying band-aids before you cut yourself, which I guess you should do. You can download the MTO manual. You, somehow you can go out to the, uh, the, the forum. Now, I don't go to the forums, but apparently you can. And if anybody finds the link to where you can download these things, please pass me the link. And, and that would be nice. But I haven't been able to find the link myself. But, but again, because I'm not looking at, at the, the forums, but if you're so inclined to go to the forums, and I understand is useful, just like what we're doing, the forums are just a giant a way of sharing information. Now, that's a great thing. If you can get the manual and print it out on a printer for whatever a stack of paper costs. Of course, the real manual for the R1 was like $80, and some of the other manuals are right in that price range. So, But, but they are worth every penny. They are really worth every penny. So anyway, I wanted to get mention that. Now... There's a fella named Scott, and Scott, I want to give you a shout out on this. I love getting an email like this. He's watching the windy videos while he's restoring his RZ350. Well, Scott, if you only knew, I wish I had an RZ350. <laughs> Dale has one. Um, Carl has one. And, and I've had chances in my life, and Rich Peabody had one at one time. And I've had chances to get one. I just haven't had the room in my garage to add another bike. And I know Luciano had one. And everybody that has one, I don't see them selling them either. So, this, so, Scott, you enjoy watching the videos while we work. Now, I understand about the videos. Some people don't even restore motorcycles. It's entertaining. That's fine. There's no problem with that. Some people, I've had people say I have a good sense of humor. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. Maybe I'd have to ask Will Smith about that. But uh, what, what's the guy that he punched? I don't even know. I don't follow movies. That's for sure. But anyway... I wanted to get on to some of the questions that I think really are worth sharing. They're not only entertaining, but people that add information that I'm not aware of. Now, I, and a good example of that is I was trying to swap mirrors on the MT-09 the other day, and in the middle of swapping the mirrors, I realized that the one on this side is a reverse thread. And I remember years and years ago, you had to buy an adapter for that side, and it came with, that was years ago. But then when I looked online right now, the, you buy the adapter all by itself for four bucks, four ninety nine. So I'm going to put more of that on a dedicated video as we we're going to do some mirror swaps and some of the mirror information that I'm sharing. You're probably not going to agree with, but think about it. It is true. Now, this there's a fellow named Carlos, and Carlos, I love. Thank you for sending emails like this. I share them with Karen. I I love him so much. He was watching windy videos. And he finally got up, got up the uh, courage to paint his MT-09 army green. Now, to be honest, anybody, I know it takes a lot of guts to, if you never have painted or if you've only painted a few things, to paint your, your pride of your fleet, if, or if you only have one bike, your only bike. But it, and it doesn't matter. And, and I wish, Carlos, you would send me some pictures to share. That would really be, really be cool. We could add it into the video. That'd be cool. And the reason he said this is cool is he paints out in the cold, too. And I sent him back a response. I said, you know, Carlos, people that paint outside are the real men of the world. We're the, we're the real uh, whatever. The real bananas. Anyway. <laughs> now, somebody named BC sent in a nice email that they watched the lever pumping video. He did the work that I show on a video. And it worked great. Well, I'm glad to hear that. But the problem is it doesn't work for everybody. You can, you can put something out there, do this, do this, do this, it'll work. It may work for me, other people it won't work for. And I got a big one at the end of the video I'm going to share. Exactly that thing. It, just because something works for you, it doesn't always work for everybody. But it works for the majority of the people, the majority of the time. And what he's probably referring to in one of the videos I put out there, of cleaning the buttons on the brake disc. And I've done that on the FCR, I've done it on the R1, and I've forever and I do it regularly but 
A lot of people don't know that, and then the lever starts pumping, and they do a... Oh. And just to mention a side thing, and Pokey, thank you, he got me new EBC discs for the GS. will work perfectly. And, and those discs were 40 years old and warped and everything from 73,000. You can imagine. And, and the EBC discs with the buttons, floaters, they work perfect. Anyway, as I go down a list of these, there's, there's always some questions that I need to address in detail. And I'm going to save that one for the very end. And it's, it's really a good one. And now, another thing here. A fellow named Flex J. I don't, I hope I'm saying these names right, or if these are acronyms or something. He has a 550, a 650, a 750, and a 1000. And he, he has his friend, his buddy, has one the same color as mine. And here's the big thing. And I've noticed this with all people my age. When you talk about age, people my age, I'm 76. People my age have memories of the times that we live. Now, younger people are going to have times of riding the R6 on a racetrack. I have memories of riding the RD at Bridgehampton, uh, in Amar. Uh, so everybody, the memories are different. And none are better than the others. And it isn't like we were some super race and, and these guys now are uh, dummies or something. We all had fun and we all share the same, the same exact passion. And some of the most fun you have is when you're out on a group ride and you meet somebody who says, oh, I had that exact bike when I was younger. And, oh, we did this and I did that. And we, we did this and went to that track meetup and you know, drag raced or whatever. And when people have those similar memories, you have some great conversations. So the next comment, I really love this too. And this really, really floats my boat. A fellow named Virgil, he has an RD400. And he was watching one of the ride videos, and a lot of people just enjoy the ride videos. I've heard this over and over. That they're at, and to be honest, this is probably pretty uh, corrupt. They're at work, and uh, you know nobody's really looking. So instead of watching the stock market, it's let's watch Wendy uh, go through the mud puddles or something. <laughs> Virgil, thank you for a nice email. Now every one of these, there, there's ones that you can answer in one sentence or one quick thing. And then there's some that really take a long time. Now, there's a fellow named Booza, and I hope I'm saying that right. I'm not mispronouncing it. I assume part of this is that uh, these are people that are very dedicated to their, their motorcycles, and they nickname themselves after the motorcycle. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe my name should be Yamaha. So. Anyway, Booza, I appreciate this. This is something he mentioned, and... He saw the video where I, I mentioned about the, the hot vibration in old, basically older bikes. And he said they put sand or BBs in the handlebar. And I've heard that too. And, and that actually is probably a way that works. But I wanted to explain something. When you do that, if, and this, this gets scientific. I don't like to do scientific things. I don't like to show off my two master's degrees in engineering. But here we are. Here's a seesaw. And picture this as a handlebar. And now it's vibrating. Now I'm going to put weight on that handlebar to stop it from vibrating. Am I going to put it near the fulcrum or out here? Well, if I put here, I'll need X amount. Here, a half of the amount and a little bit less. So by putting the weight as far out on the bar as possible, it's the most efficient. And the shorter the bars are, the more weight you need. Longer bars, less weight. That's that's basic physics. You would get that in your first year in college. Now, that's true. Filling the handlebars works too. But there's the whole point that I'm making is there's always more than one way to skin a cat. You can also put a steering dampener on. And, and back in the old H1 days, guys had two steering dampeners on them. And some of the RDs, when they raced at Bridgehampton, and I'd look over and I'd see that the steering bar, was, the steering dampener was a foot long. Luciano has a giant steering dampener on one of his bikes that I, it looked like the thing you, you shut a storm door with. There's a lot of ways to solve a problem. The first thing is always, from an engineering point of view, identify the problem and then identify all the solutions and pick the easiest one, Holcomb's razor. Always pick up the cheapest one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so the first, what I'm saying is when you have a problem like that, the easiest thing would be add some weight to the handlebars. First thing is balance the front wheel. Check the front end is tight. Maybe the steering head, if it's an old bike, these bikes I have are 30, 40 years old. 
everything's a little worn out. Now, you know, we, Luciano and I call these the old women. <laughs> We're going to take a ride on our old women, then everything's moving around. But, but good that, another point, I want to make this point, you know, and Booza, I really appreciate bringing this topic up is good because there is really a lot of ways to solve this. But moment arms, and I wanted to mention, I have seen guys do this, that they have one mirror on the motorcycle. And, and, and back in the old days, Yamahas came with one mirror. And yeah, if you're riding 50 miles an hour, that's no big deal. When you're going double that speed, it can be that you're always, you're always correcting. That's like a trim tab on an airplane out on the side. And if, you, if you're familiar with aerodynamics, you know it doesn't take much to, to make a plane go up or down. When I used to fly the air coop, and we would fly with the windows down, you could put your, and Dallas knows this is true, you could put your hands out the window and just cup them a little bit and wait about 30 seconds and the plane would start going up. It, you'd, you'd affect the aerodynamics of the plane. So anyway, the, the other point that he made, and I'm, now I'm not sure about this. This is, this is the kind of thing, I don't have a wind tunnel so I can't prove it, but I used, to, I used to have the late friend Dave Cook, anybody's a modeler knows who Dave Cook is. He was a marathon runner and we used to have an argument. And the argument was always, because I, I was a no marathon runner, and he would say what people do, they would spend X amount of money to make the shoes two grams lighter. Because you had to move that shoe, and, and yeah, that's true. And I'd say, well, you know what you could do too? You, you could shorten the shoelaces, that would make you faster. And you could do this and that would make you faster. And this, and, and it was a lot of incremental things. You could simonize your shoelaces or something. But in the end, it was incremental. It was a small, mm, but, but a lot of people enjoyed doing that. Now, we always have the thing at Perry's, and we have this every, almost every session. There'll be somebody who's, I put XXX part on my bike, my bike's a pound lighter. Well, you know, if you, I got to tell you something. A cup of coffee is more than a pound. So don't drink coffee and your bike will be faster too. And if you're caught up and I want to make my bike faster and I want to do dyno work and everything, that's a whole different, that's a different video. This video is really basically about sharing information and uh, to, to argue about the ways of making a bike faster and this and that, and I, it's, it could go on forever. But, but basically, Booza is right. You can, you can solve a problem a lot of different ways. And a lot of times I've heard people solve a problem by just replacing the front tire, and that solves the problem too. There's a lot of ways to do it. And I won't speculate which is the best or the worst or whatever. But in the end, the only thing that matters is you try the cheapest thing first, then the next one, the easiest. And, and you know, that seems to work for me all the time. And of course, a lot of these rules and common sense things that I try to share, they change dramatically if you're willing to spend a lot of money to solve problems. What we try to do on this channel is solve them without spending a lot of money. Of course, you can always just spend the money. Just go buy a new bike if it vibrates. Now, like I answered the last question, a fellow named Gorgon, who uh, has a 75 mile an hour vibration issue, a lot of times on older bikes, it's not a vibration, it's a tank slapper. You get into, <laughs> and a lot of times, older bikes with bias ply tires and, and front wheels out of balance and head bearings with a little play, it can happen. But anyway, it is always just the same as the previous question I answered. There's always the most obvious thing that's very inexpensive. Take the front wheel off the bike, have it balanced or rebalance it. Another thing, and I may have to do this at some point in time, and I'll show it. Sometimes I'll have a bike. The GS did this at one point in time, I remember. I was in maybe halfway through the life of the tire, and all of a sudden it was, what the hell is this? That tire's balanced. I look down, the tire weights are still on. Everything's, I checked that, picked the front end, checked the head bearing. Everything's perfect, no problem. What the heck's causing this? So I said, well, let me just do what I always suggest to other people do. It took the front wheel off, put it on the balancer, it was out of balance. It, it needed 30 grams of weight to get back to balance. Put it back on a bike, it was perfect. Now what happens, and I think this is true because I just had this happen with the MT-09. What happens on very powerful bikes, or bikes with very powerful brakes, the tire moves on the rim a little bit. Now when we had, on the MT-09, when I changed the tire, the original spot the red dot was, was maybe 
a, a third of the tire, a, a third of a rotation away, because that tire was spinning on the rim. And now that was a stock rim with a stock tire. It was not anything unique or anything. But sometimes that'll happen if a tire gets low on air. Mm, but I didn't have, ever had that happen. And sometimes it's just your lucky day. <laughs> Let's face it. You know, none of this stuff is a spaceship to the moon. These are things people make and, and you got human beings making them and installing them. And, and then people like me that even make it worse. But anyway, anyway, that, those tips... I think are dealt, should be dealt with very uh, judiciously. Let me just go back here. I wanted to save a couple of questions for the end because they really are, this is a real meat and potatoes question. I needed time to answer this. Now, one of the things, whenever I have a paint question and I can't answer it in one sentence, I try to refer people to how to get the video. Again, you put my name in quotation marks and... and the, whatever the subject is you're looking for, in this case, painting mirrors. Well, to painting Ducati mirrors, you know. And if the question can't be answered in one or two sentences, then that's a good way to, to get the information across or share it with somebody else. Now, a lot of people do a lot of painting, and, and they've done a lot more painting than I have. But I don't think anybody's got more video footage or tips or information available on their channel that they can refer to in one mouse click or one hot link. And so I'm thinking that that may be a valuable asset for anybody that's learning how to paint. And this next question is from Maxible. He used the video that I posted with the check engine light and I have to admit I used one of the other YouTube videos that another gentleman had posted. Younger guy, he had an MT-09 before I did. He had the check engine light come on, which is a common thing when you... Something with the traction control was, I don't remember, you turned it on or off too many times. It was something. And you had to reset it. Well, of course, what does the manual say? Bring it back to the Yamaha dealer. Well, I don't want to bring anything back to a dealer. So I, I bought the adapter. Now, and when the gentleman that posted the original video I looked at, I, I went and ordered exactly what he ordered. But he left out a step. He left out the fact you need an adapter. Well, he didn't do that on purpose. And a lot of young people don't realize how older people like me need to be pointed in the right direction. And don't forget the onions and the bananas and why my wife gives me a shopping list with underlying things under it. But it's true. And, and I know the critique of my videos from other people. Oh, they're too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but then when you're going to do something and you leave out the step of, yeah, you need the adapter. Or in the case of the mirrors, you order the mirrors and they don't tell you you need the, the adapter. <laughs> it, it doubles up on your front. And if that was the only bike you had, you wouldn't be riding. If you have other motorcycles, you just ride the other one until till the adapter comes in. But anyway, Maxible, that's a true thing. Now, this is, a, this is one we went over on one of the previous videos. Dallas responded. Dallas had an airplane. I've had an airplane. And, and airplanes always have plexiglass windshields that are going through the air at hundreds of miles an hour, high speed, they're hitting all kinds of dust and dirt from the propeller throwing things up. So you're always dealing with scratches on the soft plexiglass, which is, he sent in that one of the things he has done is 4,000 grit with soapy water, and Dallas, thank you for sharing. Meguiar's, the product is Plast X, clear plastic cleaner. And it's something I'm gonna be looking for down in my auto zone because I have scratches in my R1 windshield, and I, I have not found a product yet that just, boom, and it takes them out. And I've got to get some 4,000 grit sandpaper. I want When somebody sends me something that I know works, now Dallas has sent in other things that have proven to work. He had a degreasing uh, crud cutter. I, it's just like Simple Green. It works perfect. A lot of times you can't get Simple Green. Well, crud cutter works just as good, but... And I just love the idea that because of YouTube, we're the only generation in the history of humanity that we can just share these things. And the problem is some of the information, people have good intentions of sharing it, but they leave out a step. Uh, uh. And, and I try, it's my goal, since I've used YouTube to do millions of things, I just use it to fix my oven for Karen, to, to find out how to replace some parts on her electric stovetop. Yeah, that YouTube has the answer right there. It's beautiful. So, and it's usually really good information. So, there are 
And I, I have on my list of future videos to make one about taking scratches out of plexiglass. I just don't have any of the products I need yet, and I don't have any 4,000 grit sandpaper. But it's coming. YouTube has so many good features, so many good things. Now, I want to make sure, I wanted to save this one for the last thing. Let me make sure I covered everybody. I, didn't, I don't want to leave anybody out. And by the way, these videos go out roughly a week after I make them because of the edit time and the time at YouTube that it takes takes me to catch up. And I just wanted to make sure I did not leave anybody out. And of course, I write this down every day when I do the comments on the video. So here's the last one. And I want to... Scott sent this in. Now Scott has some pictures, and I'm going to... Maybe I'll put them in right now, right in this part. Some pictures of what he had a real problem with and I wanted to address this for you. So here you are. This is pictures Scott sent in and if you want to send pictures of your projects or things you'd like me to address and I'm going to put the I'll put it in the uh, the bottom of the screen here. It's FCRGUY72618 at gmail but I'll put that down in the in the bottom of the photo. This is Scott's paint delaminating and I'm going to address this issue. But it's nice if you have a question and you can send me some pictures, do them as an attachment, then I can include them in this video. Okay, so those are the pictures of Scott's project bike. And he's done several. And we correspond sometimes more than once a day. He's done some very unique things. He's a talented person with talented woodworking skills. I actually have one of his woodworking shirts in my arsenal of collector shirts. And everybody knows, now that they know, it's been on a video, that I collect t-shirts. So uh, it's kind of cool. Anyway, this is so important to understand. And I'm going to try to do this. I don't, I don't know if I can do it with the pad here. Let me try it with the pad, see if this works. You want to paint this surface. It could be a motorcycle, could be your guitar, could be a boat, it doesn't matter. Before you put any paint on anything, before you even approach this, clean paper towels, not dirty rags, and simple green or, in Dallas's case, crud cutter. You want to get the grease and silicone off of, the, off of this part. That's number one. Then, and only then, when the grease and oil are off, then you want to etch it. You don't want the surface, to, you don't want a piece of glass, you want a piece of sandpaper. Because you have more surface area with a, an etched surface. And more surface area means like an air filter. More surface area, it grabs better. Then you want to use the appropriate primer. If it's metal, you probably want to use self-etching primer. If it's plastic, you want primer sealer. You want one thin coat. You don't want to put on 10 coats. Now, I just did a project for, I, I think it was Turbo Steve's thing. The thing had 20 coats of primer on it. And, yeah, I can sand it all off and make it smooth and everything. But, the, but you're just wasting your money putting that primer on. It, it's better to sand the original part. Again, just my opinion. And this is the point that, that Scott had a problem with. Somewhere in this sandwich, there's the primer, the colored paint, base coat, and clear. Somewhere in that sandwich, it's coming apart like a sandwich, like a peanut butter sandwich. It's either the bread, the peanut butter and jelly, or the bread, if you vision that in your mind. So... You need to look at where it's coming apart. In other words, if you peel up the paint and there's raw metal, your primer is not sticking. You pull this up and there's primer, it's the bond between your primer and paint. It means your paint went on too dry. It didn't have enough thinner. It, it dried too fast. You did it out in bright sunlight, it dried right up. Or you used the wrong thinner. In Scott's case, I believe it was the wrong thinner. You want to try to always use mid-temp, unless there's a compelling reason to use some other thinner. Now, when you, the bond is, and, and I know I've explained this a thousand times, but we're trying to share information. And this is, there's areas, be honest about this, there's areas of things that I have a pretty decent knowledge of, and one of them is painting. Another one is aerodynamics, designing airplanes, propellers, carbon fiber. I, I, I doubt there's many questions I wouldn't be helpful in answering. You, you want to do dental work? I got a Dremel tool, but I don't do Dremel work. Yeah, <laughs> no dental work. You want to, you, Karen wants help with the cooking? I wash the pots. I don't cook. 
But there's things I know about, things I can be helpful. I can be the helpful engine on Sodor. And there's things I don't really know a lot about. And I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit I'm wrong. Now, somebody, I don't remember. I thought I wrote it down, but I guess I didn't. Somebody mentioned, and, and uh, I'm sorry I left this, this little comment out. Maybe it's in there and I just skipped over it somehow. That when I was doing the motorcycle mall video, I misidentified a bike. I said it was an MT-09 when it was an MT-7. And, and it's my fault. It was a flat black bike, and I'm holding a helmet in one hand and holding my jacket in the other hand and holding the camera. Eh, so, so maybe it's on me. In fact, it's definitely on me. And they, that's just what it's like being 76. <laughs> Anyway, back to the paint, and this is so important because, and you saw from Scott's pictures, this ruins your whole day. You get to some point in the paint job, you put some masking tape on, you pull, and up comes the paint. And you want to know where that bond did, went wrong. A lot of times it's the clear. You can pull the clear off, I call it saran wrapping. In modeling, that would happen all the time. If you try to use a, two different kinds of paint, the clear paint would come up with the tape. Sometimes the base coat came up. But anyway, the, the whole idea is to get that bond. The bond between paint is a chemical bond. The, the thinner in the paint melts the paint that's already dry and makes a chemical bond like glue. And a mechanical, it, instead of a flat surface, it's an etched surface. So it, I've had so many painting videos and I've tried never to leave those steps out. Now, maybe I do from time to time. But there's so many videos on my channel that you could watch, you could check it out. If you're really going to paint your motorcycle, are you really going to paint a part? Or, and I always suggest to people, get some old motorcycle parts, or if you have an old bike, paint something that you don't care if it comes out and practice with it. So, Scott, I hope that helps. I know you've had a decal issue too. We'll address that on a future video, and we have plenty of video of how to make your own, your own decals and stickers and stuff. That's a good topic for a future video, but I hope I haven't left I hope I haven't left anybody out, and if I have, my apologies. But again, I do this, what I think is uh, meticulously. Nope, I'm out of questions. And if, if I have left somebody out, my apologies ahead of time. And I really do appreciate when people share information, because I know, and you could do this yourself, there's, there's a test, and it's probably half bogus, but, but most of it is true. The test on YouTube is of 12 things that very intelligent people always do. And you can't hide it and you can't fake it. And one of them is you always can learn from other people. So I hope by sharing this, I've been able to learn from you and you've been able to learn from me. So I hope you did enjoy the video. We do try to post up something every day. And there's a final thought before I end the video that I always, in the back of my mind, this is always there. That no matter what bike you ride, no matter what type of riding you do, whether you like Luciano and I with these older bikes, some people like the collector bikes, some people love their Ducatis, some people like all bikes, and even our friends that ride touring bikes and Harleys and three-wheelers, and even the guy with the Nikon that's got the Nikon, I, I can't leave him out. Everybody, we share a passion, and since we've had the A-Team, over the years, we have made some incredible lifelong friendships. We've lost some people in our group, and some people, their memory lives on because of the friendship that we've had over the years. And I always think, it's always in the back of my mind, that no matter what bike you work on, and no matter what bike you paint, and no matter how you ride, what track you go to, or if you go on group rides, or if you ride like me most of the time alone, like a lone wolf, it really doesn't matter. It's the passion we share, and it's that passion that binds us all together, whether we like it or not. And it's the thing that makes our sport just a little bit different because a lot of the stuff that we do, it's difficult to do and it's it's helpful if you have friends that can help you along the way, even with just the information. Hey, to be honest, just the information that's on this video or on Windy videos, just sharing that information is such an important thing. And it's the thing in the end I always say this, it's really not about the motorcycles you ride, but in the very end, it's about the friends you make along the way for life.
And those friendships, in my case, have lasted a very, very long time. And I'm happy to say that the, even since the A-Team has disintegrated back into a smaller group, the memories of those days that we got gathered up people at Choppers and went on these rides together and went to each other's house and worked on bikes, and uh, even though some of the people are not with us anymore, those memories are priceless. They're a priceless part and I'm of my life, and I'm so glad that I have the videos and the pictures and all the things to share at this point in time. And as time goes by, these videos and these pictures just get to be more and more priceless and irreplaceable. So again, I hope you did enjoy the video and sharing our passion. <laughs>